ohne fremde Hilfe aus und wir hoffen, dass ihr auch am Dienstagabend schon in freier Laune seid und kräftig mithobt. Ich darf vorstellen, aus New York, for your brain and for your booty, Snuggy Puppy. Ever since I started this band, I have always had this weird feeling that Europe is kind of like our land of milk and honey. So for me, this was a moment where I felt like it's essential that we record in Europe. I want to get the, the vibe of a European audience being in the room with us. You know, my gut just told me that this is the place that it needs to happen. When you get to a rehearsal, it's like you feel real stupid if you're the one guy that doesn't know the songs. But if you come to a Snarky Puppy rehearsal, everyone feels stupid because nobody knows the songs. I, I didn't know a Snarky Puppy. I, I didn't know the band. So, so this week was the first encounter uh, with it. And um, it came in with an energy. Where can I start? I didn't know any of the music, um, you know, until I got there. I don't think any of us did. I've been in other situations where we cram stuff, but for this particular recording, we walked in and nothing was like even written. Literally, Mike League came in with his backpack on and he saw the piano and didn't take time to take off his backpack and started, started composing his songs, which he didn't have time to do before. And then the groove of it is like... Uh... I got a few emails a couple days before the recording session with a list of about, I don't know, 16 or 17 tunes. Not, I mean, it wasn't even a list. It was just MP3s that were sent, no names. A couple of the days leading up to the recording, you know, we would get in and kind of do individual practicing or section practicing. It, it started composing at Thursday and, 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 and there is a whole set at Monday which has the impression of, of being practiced for years and, and it's so straight on, it's, it's incredible. So we get there and it's like, yes, we're at the studio, like we got all the gear with us and we're gonna get out, we're gonna start setting up, I'm like really excited. And so I walk out, I'm like walking into the studio to check it out and then the first thing someone says, they come up to me and they're like, so like, so you heard about, you heard about Sput, right? Well, for the first th three days of rehearsal, we didn't have a drummer. And I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone was really worried. I had no worries, yeah. you know. I had, I had no worries, you know. I was like, you know, it'll, it'll come, it'll come together. Somebody's gonna show up. And if they don't show up, Corey Hinn will be, will be more than willing <laughs> to beat on somebody's drums. What's, so basically you have no drummer right now, um, but you, or you have a backup or what's the deal? Yeah, I called, uh, I put out a message to a few people and you know, the guy that I really wanted was available, so he's flying out. It's gonna okay. be fine either way. Yeah. Rehearsing all these songs that we'd never heard before without a drummer was really hard to get, it was hard to get the impression of what these songs are actually gonna sound like. During rehearsal I had like a, like, kind of like a drum set percussion rig. There's no way that you can really plan what to do without someone being there and being able to have a dialogue like between him and Nate. And so I'm just trying to like be a human metronome during these rehearsals, just so that the band can feel like a pulse and, and focus more on, you know, what, what they need to focus on. It was a bizarre experience rehearsing so minimalistically. One thing that I've learned in the, the five months, the six months that we, I've been doing this is never question anything. I think we're just used to pulling off ridiculous things that should not work. Throughout the day, just kind of get in, do a little rehearsing, do some more learning, do some more rehearsing, and then the next day we would do it all again with a new batch of songs that were emailed by Michael at four in the morning. I wouldn't say that I, that I make things difficult on everyone intentionally, 
but I would say that I don't fear it anymore. There was a certain point after like maybe the second day or something where we were rehearsing something and I was just like not feeling it. And I was just kind of like, well, you know, maybe this, maybe this record's just the one that's not gonna be that good. <laughs> And then Larnell came in uh, like Superman and played his tail off. Good Lord. So he flies through the night. Was it your Saturday night? Your Sunday night? It was my Sunday afternoon. Yeah, Sunday Your Sunday night. afternoon. Sunday evening, yeah. And flew to Holland and arrived here this morning, right? Yeah. He got in the day that we started recording. And waited two hours for a taxi that we hired that didn't show up yeah. at the airport. And then got here at like 10.30 or 11. Yeah, he had a couple hours. You know, and it took us four days. It took us four days to learn it. He had two hours. I wasn't sure how musically they would react. So I, I know how they react to me when I'm, you know, when I'm playing stuff that Spud has already played. But in terms of what I'm coming with and how I'm actually going to shift and move, move the music, they've been rehearsing the music without drums. He's only played like one or two of these songs before today. <laughs> I decided just not to worry, just to play and make music and have fun and they were really welcoming and, and made it easy for me. And then everything started to gel really quick and we're like, okay, these tunes are really cool. You know, this can be really good. It's just that we didn't have a really essential part of the band. I just kind of smile and laugh when the, when the, the really unpredictable, potentially horrific stuff happens. <laughs> like, it's just, to me, it's funny. Because I, cause I have the confidence that in the end, you know, with the people that I'm surrounded by, it's not going to be anything but really fun. I feel like I'm Han Solo, Chris is Luke Skywalker, and Bob is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Okay? This band kind of works like a big collective. We've been fortunate to have so many great musicians come through the band, come in and out of the band, and still play in the band. I mean, it's like, once you're here, you're in, you know? Chris, he's like the prodigy, like the Jedi guy. Bob is like the old wise sage guy, and I'm like the kind of rowdy, good looking guy. So there's like, you know, like 50 people or something that know all the music and can play the gig. Mike is like Princess Leia. It's great. It, we're all trying to vie for his heart. Because obviously with the amount of shows that, that, that are being booked for this band, it's, it's pretty much impossible for each instrument to hold the same person throughout like the year or a tour even. Actually, I mean, pretty much everybody who plays in the band is always in the band. My approach to Snarky Puppy musically, I just have, I have fun. So I'm the guy that's probably going to, you know, you know, I won't play anything. I make the audience say. <laughs> Turn down for what? It's the in app purchase. Oh, it's it's weird sound, when the sound sounds weird when you play it together yeah. and then the bass line's minor. So, what do I do other than that? A lot of people can kind of get the sense that maybe they're well rehearsed and that's it. And yet, the reality of coming on tour and seeing this going down for real is basically like they're saying, no. No rehearsals. I, I learned all the music actually on stage. Okay, um, let's play What About Me just to get levels cool and then let's see if we can run a couple of these new things for JT. They're 
last thing I got written down in this band was the Soli to White Cap, and that was on Tell Your Friends, which was in 2009. The only things that really get written out, I think, are string parts, normally, yeah. for the string section. They need to start learning that by ear. Now I'm talking to y'all. Yeah. I mean, it's people. You're playing music with people. You're communicating with people. I know these dudes really well. That We all know each other well, so that's how we play together. Or we just kind of, you know, throw out lines. We'll lean over, like, let's play some kind of line, or I'm hearing a line, or like some, one of the guys in the section might sing something they're hearing. Be like, eh. It'll be like yeah, yeah. one person might play something and introduce like a new concept into a song. Snarky will change up a song in a heartbeat. I think everybody in the band has a pretty low threshold for boredom. You know, they'll start playing songs it's like, what is this? <laughs> and then the melody comes in, it's like, oh, okay, you know, okay, cool. For a long time, we used to tell Mike, hey man, you point, I'll play. And like, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> so, so come up, I wouldn't know what key it was in or anything. They're like, you know what, you point, I'll play. And Mike will point, and I just, I'll play till I find him. We can go a lot of places with these tunes, and while still keeping the spirit of the song. From playing it night after night after night after night, so we're able to kind of like, identify these anchor points in the music, and in between the anchor points, we can kind of drift. Usually every night, somebody in the band will be on something. Not a, not a drug, <laughs> but just a vibe, a feeling. working together and it, like people step out and that will kind of take things into different places every crowd's different especially in Europe people are staring at you we were really freaked out by the fact that everyone was actually silent they're cheering in between songs and everything but like when it, when the, when the music is actually happening you look you know as a horn player you don't play all the time unfortunately I know I know they really listen and they're really attentive. Cool. Is this a recital? Like, what, <laughs> what are you being, are you grading me? Like, what are we doing here? It's bizarre, you can hear a pin drop. In Europe, it's like they're there to see the music. It's not really a social thing, it's more of a music thing. I remember playing and like us doing a break, and I remember hearing myself breathe. And then the place went nuts, and it was like, oh, okay, cool, they're really into it. And then they were super quiet again. I was like, okay, I guess this is just how it's gonna go. You know, it was shocking. Yeah, that was kind of like, you know, hey man, I think we've arrived. <laughs> we're a band now, <laughs> you know? People like us! <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, though, there's also times in Europe where the crowds are super, like, really unresponsive. They're very attentive, and they'll be very um, silent, you know, almost to the point where you're not quite sure if they're alive. Certain countries are more docile. And then at the end of the concert, they let you know that they enjoyed it. And, and, and 
it's such a weird feeling because you, you really have to get over what you assume in that case because what you're assuming is, oh my God, they, they hated what I just played. But then after the show, all these people come up to you and they're more excited than most cities. I think we all really started to love the way that crowds interact with you in Europe. And it's not the same in every country, for sure. It changes actually from country to country. We played in Eastern Europe for the first time in Romania. Romania! Romania is a good place. Oh, okay. We were only there for one day, but it was... Yeah, they were actually. <laughs> Bob and I had these twin Marshall stacks, and we we're just like, cool, man, like, whatever. And we got in there, and immediately everyone's was like, oh, you come to Romania. Rah. Everyone on stage is kind of down for whatever. We just want to have fun and play together, and whatever that is in that moment, we're going to do that. got there, we were like, oh man, normal people over here listen to instrumental music, not just like the weirdos that we are. Yeah, our are coming in with like a lunch or something, like I was saying, hey, I was just on the day off, do you want to go to the Romania? I was like, yeah, 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 let's go. I think for me, the stuff that really stands out on this past tour are, are all the countries that I thought I would never get to visit. Stockholm, and then Brussels, and then we went to Rotterdam, and then from Rotterdam to Bucharest, and then Bucharest to Istanbul, and then Istanbul to Paris, from Paris to Cork. It was just such a kind of a out of body, surreal experience. And I think the reason it felt like that for me was, it was literally back to back. For me, what stands out in my mind is Istanbul. Unbelievable city. Ooh, we should get some food or something. Yeah. Now we're in Istanbul. Istanbul? Yeah. Istanbul. It was very interesting just to see the people and the marketplaces were absolutely gorgeous. We were there, I think, like 16 hours or something total from when we landed to when we flew. Any free minute we had, we were walking around the city and checking out the mosques and the water and, you know, it was... It was Really, you just feel like you're on another planet. The easiest point is to go to Gaza Tower. So you okay. see, you know, all the other. You guys don't have vertigo or any kind of high anxiety, right? No, no. Each street is like a, a certain thing. So like, I found the music street, and for like seven or eight blocks, it's street musicians and music stores. And it was just a very interesting culture, very unlike anything that we've ever experienced as a band. And I want to send a message to Europe that this is a place that we love to play in, a place that we love to hang out in, a place that we love to eat in, you know, and, and travel throughout. <laughs> Travel diary. Uh, Cork, Ireland was really cool. They were right up for the crack there. <laughs> Tell by my driving that this isn't my normal job lady. <laughs> so we had just done like six days of pretty brutal traveling in wonderful places. And then we came out of the baggage claim area into the, the terminal. And it's not a big airport, but, and there's not a lot of people. So it's just this big room and there's like a stage on the left side of the room as we go in. Yeah, there was a, um, an Irish crooner. <laughs> <laughs> he 
in the main terminal with like a banner behind him and like, you know, signs advertising the lounge man. With like canned music in a, I think he was in a tuxedo or a suit or something and he was singing, uh, New York, New York. <laughs> Singing selections from the Great American Songbook. <laughs> just like hanging out, just like rocking New York, New York. And like Bill's like going around in the airport cart, like doing circles. He was like so happy to be in Ireland. <laughs> in Germany and and we walk onto the stage and there's this group of kids that were right in front of us and they're in the front they got their arms on the stage they're like eight years old all of them it's always hard to tell how old people look you look at them and, and people can look younger or older and like the little little kids on the front of the kinder chocolate package and they all had beers they had beers and they were chugging these beers and this kid was doing it like he was drinking orange juice, like it just wasn't a... It, like, didn't seem out of the ordinary to him at all. Holy sh... They were eight. <laughs> they were like eight years old. Definitely no, definitely no older than ten. No, no older than ten. No, this kid was young. I swear these kids looked like they were twelve. Surprised they could even lift them to their face. They were eight, they were eight. They weren't even older than eight. Oh my god. No one care. It's Germany, man. So that was a, a welcome to, to Germany moment. Yeah, there was a one one show was so hot in Dresden in Germany. We played this tiny room downstairs, like a jazz club. Stone, kind of underground basement club that was super cool. It's like there's no stage, it's like there's the floor and we're there with the people hanging out. It was just rammed with people and there's no air conditioning because it's Germany in the winter. And this room was so hot, I'm telling you, it was like a kiln, dude. It was so hot. Halfway through that gig, I felt like I had jumped into a pool with my clothes on. I think Justin stripped down to his underwear. My pants were soaked after the gig, and I was just like, this is stupid. <laughs> Prouder moments in my life. I, you know, it's funny, I forget about all this stuff. came from Germany originally and settled in Anglia. What about the Saxons? They came from Germany as well, modern day Germany. What's your ancestry? Uh, mainly Irish, but a bit of Viking. Would <laughs> you like a cup of tea? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> when Mike sent us the dates, he was like 200 some days on the road and I was like, holy <laughs> shit, am I gonna be able to deal with that? We never take days off really. For us, there is no such thing as Cush touring. It's still, you know, 
10 to 13 dudes in a van. Cats is like sharing rooms and, you know, in a bus for 16 hours. Where am I eating? Where am I sleeping? Uh, and have some fun in between. This is the tour life for me. This band stays alive just because we figured out ridiculous things to do to just to not get completely lost in this weird kind of groundhog day scenario of like waking up and living the same day over and over in different places. You're with these people, you know, day in and day out, hour after hour. You wake up and they're there. Staying sane on the road is like a very specific and very important skill. All right, other side, here's a five. <laughs> All right, let's bump it up. Eight, it's good. Oh, 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 oh. Here it goes, baby! Hey, ah. it. Ah. <laughs> yeah, it's been very funny in the bus a lot of the time. I feel like a sense of humor is essential in surviving in life. <laughs> you got good tone on your It's like nice and joking sound. Our driver Quinny taught us this game. Oh, God kind of resembles American paper football that we used to play when we were kids, like at our desks in school. And you take any sort of larger kind of coin in whatever country that you're in, and you get on opposite sides of a table with your opponent. <laughs> you suck! <laughs> you suck too! You slide the quarter across the table. The object is to get the quarter to hang ever so slightly over the lip of the table. I'm not falling off. Ooh. Line judge on that one. If you get it there, then the next part is you flip up the coin and then you have to catch it. What the f oh. oh my god! <laughs> You're so good at this part! He sucks so bad! He sucks! He sucks so bad! <laughs> then I can hear it perfectly. No way, no way. The hell is wrong with you? I'm not the least. <laughs> then the other person makes this like goal thing. Let's see. How do they do it? How do you do the goal? You get this weird little goalie. Uh, it's like this. So then you got your goalie in the middle here. Bam. The defender. <laughs> Spin the coin. Then you have to catch it between your thumbs and launch it through. <laughs> Amazing. Oh. Really, it's more just like a, a study in the individual psychology of the guys in the band. Competitive nature of certain people in the band. I won't mention any names. Oh, You're going down. Oh, you ready? You ready? I'm ready. ready. I'm ready. Go for it. No. Oh my God! <laughs> it's sad. It's sad that it got people riled up. <laughs> and Justin is really competitive, for one thing. Hands like frying pans. <laughs> you can't. You Watch got. and learn, bitch. Oh my God! <laughs> We sucked at it. And he sucked. He, he could not play the game. He couldn't get past the first step. <laughs> no. Good job. <laughs> oh, why do I do that? Oh. Ah, go down the table! That's, that's, that's what we've kind of regressed to, is this stupid game. <laughs> oh my god, are you kidding me? <laughs> It's such an amazing thing to play in a room full of so many people and it's, it, it means so much for us to, to travel and, and to know that like it feels worth it for us to be doing what we're doing all year, every day, all day. So um, before we play the last tune, I just want to say on behalf of the whole band, thank you so much for supporting us. And, uh,
Man, we played so many gigs this year. It's been 10 years, right? So I feel like from the start of it till now, it's been like an incline of more shows, more shows, more shows each year. In a world of like instant gratification and like shortcuts and like I can have it now or like, you know, TV shows where you win a million dollars or a con recording contract. There's no real substitution for like, like putting in the work. From the beginning to now, it's night and day. We've worked for it. This band has been a labor of love for all of us for a number of years. For this band, there's been years and years of like not great gigs. We would book tours and not have a place to stay. You know, we'd play the gig and then we'd be asking people at the gig, so. <laughs> <laughs> Playing for crowds that are smaller number than the band. Hey. I'm really glad you like the band. This is great. Uh, you guys want to party afterwards or, you know, hang out or something? Do you have a place here in town? The, the thing about this band is that things have always been going up. So right when you got to a point where it felt like I can't do this anymore, things would get better, improve enough to the point where it was okay. It's like watching the tree, you know, grow, you know. And so, you know, just as, just as tall as the tree grows, you know, up under, you have all these roots. If you b really believe in what you're doing, just keep doing it. The music always comes first, no matter what we're doing. I always, I always feel that with these people. You know, we have the freedom to create music that we want to create, and we're doing that. And there's not like some kind of pre, like there's not someone telling us you need to make this kind of record and this kind of sound and limit it to this. They don't have to please any A and R directors. They don't have to please any radio personalities. They don't have to please. They can just play music. And guess what? People still like live good music. You at least want to like entertain people and then hopefully contribute something artistically. I care what the audience thinks. I think we all care what the audience thinks and we want them to enjoy it. But the enjoyment to me is not going to come out of us not being who we are. I don't think this band will have to deal with like being um, safe to sell records. We've gained a fan base by doing what we've been doing going in like a an overly accessible direction or a, like an overly simple direction i think is is kind of contrary to the to the momentum and, and ultimately contrary to what the people that like us want and definitely what, what we want and if the art and the music is not what is thought of first then i don't think i'd want to do it and i think a lot of the guys probably feel the same way the band is developing because we're spending time together. You know, we're trying to evolve and just kind of show that we can, we're up for anything is basically the message, you know. Well, you're gonna do Snarky Puppy on Ice. That's what's next. <laughs> it's a big family. You know, we've played together for so many years and, and spent so much time on the road together. We all know each other really well, musically and personally. Everybody's heart is still in it, even though they've seen the other side, you know? They've seen the they've seen the tour buses, they've seen the hotel rooms, they've seen all that stuff. The people are great, the music's great. I'm with friends all the time. It's like what you want as a musician, you know? I would still do this even if we made no money. I would still do it. Which we do. Make no money. <laughs> I'm trying to sell it, Mike. I'm trying to sell it. Um, it's been a crazy, crazy, crazy week full of all sorts of surprises. Um, all of them good, I would say, in the end. Um, and, and it's been, it's been really, really wonderful, uh, playing all these tunes for so many different groups of people. And, uh, this is, uh, obviously, I think probably you all know this because this was the first set to sell out, but, but this is the set where, where you never know what will happen. <laughs> Sean Martin. <laughs> you have no clue what's about that. You have no idea. It could go really good or really, really bad. I don't even know. I'm really, just going to really sit here. You could just do all ballads. You could just do all ballads. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, I've been looking at you from across the room, and you are very <laughs> sexy. Gotta do the low snare. It's gotta be the low. 
baby. <laughs> New Stalking Purpose song. Can I get a kiss? Hey. Sean Martin, ladies and gentlemen. That's a number one, number one seller. Yeah. Right up on the Miley Cyrus. That's <laughs> Quick question.